Hey everyone, this lesson is on gastroparesis. So in this lesson, we're gonna talk about what this condition is. We're also gonna talk about some of the causes or risk factors. We'll also talk about some of the signs and symptoms, how we can diagnose it and how we can treat it. So if we break down the word gastroparesis, the prefix gastro means stomach and the suffix paresis means a weakness or paralysis or partial paralysis. So that's what gastroparesis is. It is a paralysis of the stomach. But more specifically, gastroparesis is a condition of delayed gastric emptying without a mechanical obstruction. Very key here, without mechanical obstruction. So here's a diagram of what gastroparesis might look like. So here's a diagram of a normal stomach with normal contractive movements, allowing proper emptying of the stomach. But in the case of gastroparesis, there is some issue with the neurological input to the stomach. Perhaps the vagus nerve is damaged. And this prevents proper contractive movements, especially antral contraction, to allow the proper emptying of the stomach. So gastric motility and gastric emptying are complex processes. It involves complex coordination involving sympathetic, parasympathetic neurons like the vagus nerve and requires proper functioning of interstitial cells of Kajel or what we call the pacemaker cells in the stomach, allowing that proper contraction or proper contractility. The epidemiology of gastroparesis, if we look at the genders, females to males, generally speaking, females have a higher prevalence of gastroparesis, generally from three to four to one ratio. So what are some of the etiologies or some of the risk factors for gastroparesis? So the risk factors or causes of gastroparesis include the following. Number one is idiopathic. We simply don't know what causes gastroparesis. This is called idiopathic gastroparesis, and it is actually the most common cause being responsible for roughly half of all cases of gastroparesis. The second main category of causes is diabetes mellitus. This leads to what we call diabetic gastroparesis. And when we look at Patients with type 1 diabetes versus patients with type 2 diabetes, type 1 diabetics have a worse clinical presentation. They have worse diabetic gastroparesis. And the way diabetic gastroparesis occurs is through nerve damage or injury to neurons innervating the stomach. But what happens in diabetes or diabetic neuropathy, the longest neurons become affected first. So we often require diabetic neuropathy in the lower extremities before an individual will have diabetic gastroparesis because diabetes affects the longest neurons first and then as the diabetic neuropathy worsens, some of the shorter neurons will become affected and some of those will be in the stomach. So that is why we get diabetic gastroparesis. The third main category of causes is medications. Some of these include opiates, so morphine, hydromorphone. We can also see it with TCAs or tricyclic antidepressants, calcium channel blockers, cyclosporin, phenothiazines, dopamine agonists, octreotide, liraglutide, which is a GLP-1 agonist. We can also see it with lithium, progesterone, dopamine agonists, and clonidine. Another category of causes of gastroparesis is surgery-related. So any surgery involving the stomach can lead to gastroparesis if there is any injury to the neural input to the stomach, especially vagal nerve injury during surgery. So gastric resections can lead to gastroparesis as well. The fifth main category of causes is neurological conditions. So this makes sense. If there is a condition that causes generalized neurological issues, we can have issues with the neural input to the stomach. So some conditions like Parkinson's disease, and multiple sclerosis can cause gastroparesis through these mechanisms. The sixth main category of causes is rheumatological conditions. Some of these include scleroderma and amyloidosis. Most of the time, these conditions cause gastroparesis due to, with scleroderma specifically, it is collagen deposition, and amyloidosis, it's deposition of amyloid proteins causing issues with the neural input to the stomach. The seventh main category of causes is spinal trauma. So again, if you damage your spinal cord at a level that affects the innervation to the stomach, this can cause issues with neural input and cause gastroparesis. The eighth main category of causes is viral infections. This is something we call post-viral gastroparesis. So interestingly, if you've had a prior infection with norovirus or rotavirus, it can lead to some temporary gastroparesis. 
And oftentimes, this may take a month or more before it fully resolves. So a lot of causes here, but for the most part, these causes are related to autonomic dysfunction. So a dysfunction of the autonomic neural input to the stomach leading to issues with gastric contractility. So what are some of the clinical features of gastroparesis? We talked about gastroparesis leading to delayed gastric emptying and issues with gastric contractility. This all leads to chronic nausea and vomiting. Because we're not able to empty our stomach properly and digest our food properly, we get chronic nausea and vomiting. And the vomitus can actually show undigested food even upwards of four hours after eating. There's also an increased frequency and severity of vomiting in diabetic gastroparesis. We can also see early satiety. So early satiety is a sensation of feeling very full very quickly after you have just started eating. So you can't eat as much as you used to. And again, this is because there's delayed gastric emptying. You get full quicker, essentially. There's also what we call postprandial fullness. So after you have eaten, you feel full for a long time afterwards. So you feel very full. And this is again due to that delayed gastric emptying. Individuals with gastroparesis may also have issues with upper abdominal pain. They might not have it, but they may. And it's described as vague or burning or crampy in nature. And if you do have upper abdominal pain, the majority of cases worsen with eating. So these three clinical findings, early satiety, postprandial fullness, and upper abdominal pain are more likely to occur in idiopathic gastroparesis. We may also see bloating or belching. And in severe cases of gastroparesis, we may see weight loss as well. And we can also see dyspepsia. So this makes sense. If food is just sitting in your stomach, it's not emptying properly, you can have issues with heartburn and indigestion. And there may be some associated peripheral neuropathy. This is in the case of diabetic gastroparesis. So gastroparesis itself does not cause peripheral neuropathy. But in the case of diabetic gastroparesis, the neuropathy from diabetes will affect the lower extremity neurons first and then the neurons innervating the stomach later. So if they do have diabetic gastroparesis, they're more likely to have peripheral neuropathy. So how do we diagnose gastroparesis? The diagnosis of gastroparesis involves a couple of steps. Step one is to rule out a mechanical obstruction. We can do this through using imaging like a CT scan or we can use upper endoscopy to assess for any mechanical obstructions like malignancy. Once we have ruled out a mechanical obstruction, we move on to an emptying study or scintigraphy. So what an individual does is they ingest radio tracer, usually in the form of eggs. But prior to ingesting the eggs or the radio tracer, they have to do several things. They have to stop taking medications that delay gastric emptying. We've talked about those before. So stop any of those that might be causing delayed gastric emptying. They also want to try to maintain good blood glucose control. Once they have ingested that radio tracer food, we wait two to four hours to see if they have actually digested the food. So they are positive or they have gastroparesis if greater than 60% of stomach contents remain after two hours of ingesting the radio tracer or greater than 10% of stomach contents remain after four hours of eating the radio tracer. So those are the two main ways to make the diagnosis of gastroparesis. We can break down the four hour mark a bit more. If it is 10 to 15% of stomach contents, it is mild gastroparesis. If it is 15 to 35%, it's moderate gastroparesis. And if it's greater than 35% of stomach contents after four hours, that is severe gastroparesis. So how do we treat gastroparesis? Treatment of gastroparesis involves several methods. The first methods we wanna use are the conservative methods. These include dietary modification. So we try to get them to eat low fiber, small volume diets. And we want to avoid fatty or spicy foods or insoluble fiber. Insoluble fiber makes it very difficult for the stomach to digest and churn over that food. We also may have to liquefy foods in severe cases of gastroparesis. You also want to avoid alcohol, smoking, or carbonated beverages. Carbonated beverages can lead to gastric distension. And you also want to maintain good hydration and maintain good blood glucose control. So in the case of diabetic gastroparesis, a lot of times due to that chronically high level of blood glucose or poorly controlled blood glucose, you can have irreversible damage to the nerves innervating the stomach. 
So you might not be able to reverse that, but actually maintaining a good blood glucose control can still help you with some of your gastroparesis symptoms. It has been shown that even acute changes in blood glucose levels can affect or alter gastric emptying. And you also want to avoid medications known to cause delayed gastric emptying as well. And you also want to exercise. This can also increase gastric motility. And if the conservative methods don't work, we move on to pharmacological methods. So we use prokinetic agents like metoclopramide. Metoclopramide is actually first line. We take it by PO or by mouth, and it's used for stable disease. Once you start using metoclopramide, you don't want to use it for more than 12 weeks, or you try not to use it for more than 12 weeks unless the benefits outweigh the risk. There is risk of having tardive dyskinesia and extra pyramidal side effects the longer you use metoclopramide. If you're done using metoclopramide, you can move on to domperidone, and you may also use erythromycin as well. Erythromycin can be used PO by mouth or IV, and you use erythromycin for less than four weeks because of tachyphylaxis. So tachyphylaxis is when it stops working, essentially. So you start taking erythromycin, it works, and then after a while, it loses its effectiveness. That is what tachyphylaxis is. And if none of these work, there are other methods like surgical methods that can be employed to treat gastroparesis. So I hope you found this lesson helpful. If you did, please give it a thumbs up and consider subscribing to the channel. And as always, thanks so much for watching and I hope to see you next time.